So today we're starting a new series called The Heart of Heaven, and tonight we're ta- today we're talking about come close and the idea of being close to Christ. And, and here's what I know about people. Um, my goal for you is that you would know how much God loves you. You know, Paul said that you'll, you would grow in the knowledge of his love for you. And I think one of the reasons we push God away sometimes or we run from God like, like Adam and Eve did and we try to hide is because we don't understand or, un, or see ourselves the right way. So we're going to look at these three things today. We're going to look at how we see ourselves, how we see Jesus, and then we're going to talk about surrendering to his world. Now, you ever have a wrong perspective on something where you see something the wrong way? So a few years ago, we went to MGM Studios, and that'll tell you how long ago this was. And uh, I was a school teacher, and we got to go for a tour that was considered uh, uh, studying or something, a field trip, which was hilarious, MGM Studio. The kids just wanted to ride the rides. They didn't care. But anyway, so, but during the tour, as they gave us the tour, the, the tour guide, there was this one part where if you're looking down, it's still there. If you're looking down the street, there are buildings in the background. And you can see the buildings, and they let us go past the barricades and stand next to the building. So I was like six stories high and going, you know, and kids were taking pictures. But the other teacher was like two feet taller than me, and so he looked like Godzilla uh, towering over the buildings. And we were grabbing the buildings and everything. And then security showed up and started yelling at us, and then we went, oh, oh, it was them. Now, what's amazing is if you go to Disney World and you're just walking down the street, it looks kind of like tall buildings down the street until you get closer to them and you're like, oh. Now, most of you have done that tour out at the Space Center where the VAB, they drive you towards the VAB. And as you get closer, you're like, wow, that building's really big. And then they show you that flag that from a distance just looks like a flag. And then they tell you, what do they tell you? Come on. Do you remember what they tell you about the flag stripes? They tell you the same thing every time. Yeah, you can drive a bus up those stripes, right? Every time they tell you the same thing. And it's true. When you get close to it, you realize that flag is gigantic. But when you're far away, you don't really have a sense of perspective. I think sometimes when it comes to our relationship with God, because we are far away, either because we pushed ourselves away or maybe we just have a misunderstanding about who God is, it really messes up what we see. So today, as I talk about these three points, I hope that you'll get a new perspective. So let's talk about number one, how we see ourselves. And we're going to, these are three things that impact our closeness with God. And we're going to look at two different stories today. We're going to look at the story of Zacchaeus, and we're going to look at the story of the prodigal son. And I think that will, or as some call it, the prodigal father. So here we go. Luke chapter 19, if you have your Bibles, you can open there. It'll also be on the screen. Here's what it says. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. And I'll tell you about tax collectors in a second. And was wealthy. And there's a reason he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short. Time out. Uh, Zacchaeus, patron saint of people who can't reach the top shelf. Okay? So if you're one of those, Zacchaeus, you should be like, we love you, Zacchaeus. You are In scripture, there's even a song about you. It's really great. All right. So, because he could not see over the crowd. Now, you got to realize, back then, people were like 5'1". So, I don't know how tall Zacchaeus was, but he was a wee little man. Okay, according to the song. So, he ran ahead. Okay, two things that you don't do as a man, he gets ready to do back in this time. So, he ran ahead. By the way, there were two real reasons that they didn't run back then. It was seen as undignified to run. And number two, um, uh, this was before air conditioning. And when you ran, you stank, just so you know. I mean, think about it. So men typically didn't run. It wasn't considered dignified. But then he did something else that men didn't do. He climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Now think about this. He was excited about seeing Jesus. But he didn't try to move in front of the crowd. Now, as you're going to discover later, the local people did not like him. Why? He was a tax collector. So here's the deal about tax collectors that you've probably never heard. The Jews could choose to be tax collectors if they wanted to, but you were hated by everyone. You were considered a traitor. It would be like if if the Chinese invaded our country and then said, do any of you guys want to be tax collectors? And you said, yes, 
I'll be a tax collector for you, Chinese government. And then they would send Roman soldiers with Zacchaeus. He could show up at somebody's house, knock on the door, take a look around at whatever he wanted and say, you owe me, and just name whatever he wanted. And Rome didn't mind if he took his cut of whatever was paid. Now, if you didn't know, bribes still go on all over the world. When you adopt a child from different countries, they call it a legal fee. But most adoption agencies know that there are certain countries you adopt from that you are just greasing the wheels of government. So Zacchaeus was on the other end of that. He was the one who was collecting without anyone to hold him accountable and so most believe that he was doing what most tax collectors did at the time and taking extra. Now, Matthew was a tax collector, but he was a, a toll road collector. He wasn't very loved either because, once again, who did he work for? He, he worked for Rome. And as people passed by, he was like, ah, looks like you got some extra ukuleles there. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know why ukuleles just came to mind. They're just random. I, I know they weren't carrying bacon. We'll talk about that later. Right? So, so you got some extra ukuleles. That'll be, you know, whatever drachmas. I don't know what the, I can't remember the currency. All right. So here he is in partnership with this government that they hated. So much so that in the temple, the temple did not use Roman money. They had their own money. And the way the Romans got around that is they charged them a temple tax. And you had to pay extra just to use, not use Roman money in the temple. Um, by the way, they left their eagle up in the temple, which is prophesied about in the Old Testament. It's just one of those coincidences, right? Now, a little later, we're going to talk about Zacchaeus' view. Zacchaeus' view of Jesus was like the song. And I want you to know the song you sang, if you sang it as a little kid, it was wrong. And so if you've never sang the song, it goes like this. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in his motions i'm not doing them uh, climbed up in a sycamore tree because the lord he wanted to see and as the savior passed that way he looked up in the tree and here's how the song goes and this is the wrong part and he said and if, at this part of the song you're supposed to wag your finger and say zacchaeus I, they don't grit their teeth i just do that because it's funny zacchaeus you come down for i'm going to your house today that's how the song goes all right so so that's the song but the wrong part about the song is the wagging the finger and pointing. And I'm telling you, that's what Zacchaeus thought was going to happen. Actually, more likely, he went and climbed up the tree and thought that he would not be noticed. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Why? Because he viewed himself. So let's pick up in Luke 15 to look at the prodigal son story. And then we'll put the two together to show you how we view ourselves. The prodigal son story, remember, the younger son asked for his inheritance, which, by the way, if you have a younger brother, they're not supposed to do that. The older brother's supposed to get his inheritance first. But the younger brother says, hey, let me have my inheritance. You owe me. He's a really self-centered guy. And he ends up what? Out in the field. Uh, uh, he ends up without any money. He's spending on wild living. And so now he's got no money to the point that finally he's feeding pigs as a Jewish person, you don't want to feed pigs. I'll show you that in a minute. So it says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go to my father and say to him, now I want you to look at the length of this speech. That's important in a few minutes, okay? Father, let me do it like, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. This is the way I want my children to talk to me when they do something wrong. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Right? And so he has this whole speech. Just make me a servant. I, I'm just, I just want to be back in the house. I'm looking at pig slop. Wait, let me just give you an example of pigs. Okay? All right, look in the background behind Kristen and I. That is a hog. That is a big old hog. This hog has probably been rubbed down with oil this day. They, they have nice clean hay and everything. We walked around the corner to the real place the pig hangs out. You know, the place where the prodigal son was. Now, this is a washed pig, a cared for 
pig, one that's going to become bacon one day. It's very exciting. And this one's, this one's ready to go. But you walk around back and, and, the, and the wonderful, beautiful scent of slop just comes across you. If you have never smelt that wonderful smell that I smelt as a child since my grandfather raised hogs and I remember going with him and he would scratch the hogs back and I remember that first whiff of uh, uh. I mean the the okay maybe you'll understand this some of you are old and so now you love birds and if your bird food goes bad in the bird feeder that's just a, a little bit of what it's like to smell a hog I mean it's just so imagine the prodigal son he's feeding the hog in that stinky place now I don't know if you've ever gotten not hungry near something that stinks. He was so hungry that in the stinkiest place you can think of, the most place you can think of, he's going, oh, those pea pods look good. The pea pods that somebody threw out in their garbage look good to me. Oh, no. Father. He finally came to his senses. You know, the truth is, for many of us, we don't come to our senses till we come to the end of ourselves. Till we run out of realizing that we're not worthy. And so, here's the thing. We are unworthy, but God still loves us. Let me tell you something. The enemy's going to come to you and say, you're not worthy of God's love. And let me tell you what you say. Exactly. God's love is not fair. It's not fair. It's unfair. He should not love us. But he does. But he does. Listen to this quote. Simply by our proximity to Jesus, we can bring hope and life to people and places trapped in discouragement and despair. Listen, just by you understanding how much God loves you, you will talk to people differently. You'll treat people differently and you'll bring God's love to them. Number two, not only how we see ourselves, but how we see Jesus. How many of you ever climbed trees as a kid? So in Miami, we not only had cool trees to climb, and I'm not telling the story where I fell out of the tree today. Uh, not only do we have, but we had these banyan trees in Miami. And I don't know if you've ever climbed a banyan tree, but they got all these little roots that come down and your hands get really sticky from the roots. If you've never done that, when you go to Miami sometime, you can try it out just for fun. And we had these huge banyan trees and there was one near our church. And my friends and I used to go out and we would climb up in this banyan tree and you could watch people and they had no idea you were there. And it was great because we just, you know, we'd be talking and they didn't know we were there and we didn't know they were, they, they didn't know we were there. And that's all that I was going to say. All right. So, so here's the thing. If you've climbed a tree before, you understand it's a different perspective of life. Well, well, Zacchaeus was trying to get up where he could see Jesus, but he didn't expect Jesus to do anything. He just thought, I'm going to watch him walk by because Jesus doesn't want to have anything to do with me. And as you'll see in a minute, he was told that by all the people in town. Watch this. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up. And I'm sure, can you imagine, it, like, like if you were in a tree watching somebody, and all of a sudden they went, boop. That's almost like a horror movie, isn't it? Like, whoa, right? They saw me, right? And so G G Zacchaeus is watching Jesus, and all of a sudden Jesus does the whoop. And I'm sure, for an instant, Zacchaeus was like, oh, no. I'm getting ready to get called out for being a sinner, for being a tax collector. And here's what Jesus says. Let's do his first words. Zacchaeus, come down immediately. And I'm sure Jesus, that Zacchaeus is still like, oh no. Right? If he can heal people, I bet you he can kill people. Right? Zacchaeus, come down immediately. And then he says this. I must stay at your house today. So instead of wagging his finger, you come down. He says, where, where are you going today? I want, I want to go with you. Let's, let's go to your house. So he came down at once. That's the obedience, by the way. He came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And listen to what happened. All the people saw this and began to mutter. He is gone to be the guest of 
a sinner. Now, this word for mutter is kind of a cool word. It's kind of the cooing of doves. I don't know if you've ever heard doves. They're all kind of talking to each other. Or it also is the buzzing of bees. Go ahead and try that. Let's try that. That sounds like fun. One, two, three, go. Yeah, just like that. So you can imagine, here you were in, in, on the road, and all of a sudden Jesus says, Hey, Zacchaeus, come with me. And everybody, I can't believe it. Who does he think? He's going to eat with I came with him. Wait a minute. The sad truth is that many people see Jesus like the people on the road. And the problem with looking at other people and saying, You're not worthy to talk to Jesus is, you recognize in yourself that you're not worthy to talk to Jesus. So if you look at other people and say they shouldn't talk to Jesus, then you realize in your deepest, darkest thoughts on the worst day you've ever had that you're not worthy either. And so you're muttering not just to others but yourselves. See, one of the things that changed our perspective, this is not in your notes, but Ephesians 2.13 says, Now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought close, have been brought close. Jesus wants to be close to us. Let's skip down to number three. So how we see ourselves, how we see Jesus, number three, when we surrender to his will. So I went with a bunch of youth pastors in 30 degree weather, snow on the ground to play paintball. By the way, you should not play paintball when it's cold. Let me just point that out now that I know. This was years ago when I was young and foolish. Now I'm old and foolish. So, um, So we were playing paintball, and at one point somebody called a timeout, and my brother had been hiding under a log right here, and one of his friends was right here next to him, and when they called timeout, my brother said, hey, to the guy, and the guy's like, hey, how you doing? And then the guy said, time in, (laughs) not 10 seconds till time in, time in. So this friend, friend, turned and went, poof. And my brother said these words, ow. Okay, that wasn't exactly the words, but something like that. Ow. And then he said, I surrender. I'm done. I'm not playing anymore. This is enough. That hurt. And that wasn't fair. And, and right? By the way, I shot a guy who's a music pastor right here in the head and blackened both of his eyes. He had to go and lead music at his church with two black eyes and tell them some pastor blackened both of his eyes. Now, surrender changes everything. You can't half surrender. <laughs> you can't surrender and then say, but here's what I'd like. I surrender. Now, can I have, right? Surrender is surrender. Listen to what it says here. But Zacchaeus stood up. So Jesus comes to his house, eats with him. Zacchaeus stands up at the end of dinner and says, Lord, look, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. And then listen to what Jesus says. Today, salvation has come to this house. And listen to what he says. For this man, too, is a son of Abraham. What's he saying? He hasn't been kicked out of his family. He's still part of the Jewish nation. He is a son of Abraham. And then he says, for the son of man came to do what? To seek and to save that which is lost. You know, some of us, because of how we grew up, we feel like God is just putting up with us. We, we have this idea in the back of our mind that God, you know, he loves us, but he's like, oh, come on. You know, it's like that one meme where the guy's like, oh, right? And we think that's what God, but it's nothing like that. Jesus is excited. He goes to his house on purpose. He pursues a relationship with him. You'll see another place in scripture where it says about a guy who rejected Jesus. Jesus looked at him and loved him. We usually don't think of God that way. By the way, Jesus is God. If you don't know the scripture, that's what it's talking about in the book of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. God did not create Jesus. Jesus was with God. It's part of the Trinity, and it goes beyond our thinking. People are like, explain the Trinity. And they go like, it's like an apple, but it's not. But it is, but it's not. And, and, and Jesus was always with God from the beginning. That's what we learn in the book of John, three and one. 
And so Jesus is looking at Zacchaeus and goes, now salvation has come. You're a part of the family still. Let's go down to the prodigal son and see what happens next. So he got up. He went to his father. I'm sure the smell was a lot better on the way. But now he was barefoot. Why? Because slaves were barefoot. Now he had lost everything. So he's down to tattered clothes, barefoot. I don't know if you've been walking barefoot lately, but that's not fun at all. By the way, they would make slaves barefoot so they couldn't run off. And so he got up, went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with anger and hatred. No, he was filled with compassion for him. Remember I talked about perspective? As the son's coming up, the father sees the son, knows who it is. I don't know whether the son knew who the father was or not. And then when what happens next, I'm sure the perspective of the son was very different. Here's what it says. He ran to his son. I'm sure as the father was running out, the son was expecting a scolding. Anybody listening, the Pharisees and Sadducees who were listening to this story were like, oh, it's about to get good, right? Here comes the judgment. Let's put the hammer down. And he kissed him, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son starts the speech. Listen, then the son said to him, here we go, <clears throat> Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And right, he's getting ready to say, make me a servant. And before he gets there, what happens? He's interrupted. What's all this nonsense? He says, but the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his stinky, dirty, muddy, gross feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He's lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now you have to realize the story actually continues with the older brother being jealous of the son and angry. Because he's not been treated that well. Why? Because God's love is not fair. Did you hear me? God's love's not fair. How could God love somebody like that? Because God's love is not fair. Hey, hey. I had a friend one day, I said, so-and-so's gossiping about me. This is what they're saying about me. And here's what he said. He said, if they really knew the worst thing about you, would you care if that's what they said? Oh, no. No, no. No, that's fine. They can gossip. Right? And the truth is, for all of us, we know the worst thought, the worst desire, the worst thing we ever thought. And so when we look at somebody else and we stand and go, I can't believe they did that. Then we say to ourselves, I can't believe I did that. But that's how good God, God's grace is. When we come home, when we repent, and we say, Father, I'm sorry. God, I have this area of my life that I don't want to surrender to you. Would you take care of me? God, I have this thoughts, these thoughts in my head that I'm struggling with, with. I want to surrender them to you. Lord, I don't think you love me, but I'm surrendering that to you. Lord, I struggle in this area, but I surrender that to you. God, I've made some really bad choices, but I surrender that to you. That's what salvation is. And when you get closer to Christ, your perspective begins to change because as you spend time in His Word, you begin to recognize that even though you're sinful and messed up and broken, that He absolutely loves you. That's why John 3, 16, Jesus, Jesus Himself says, God so loved the world. That's you, that He gave His one and only Son. That whoever believes... Believes whoever puts their faith in him will not perish but have eternal life. Why? Because he wants to bring you home. And he wants to sit down and have fellowship with you. Is that your view of God? Is your view of God that he desires to know you? And that even though you're not worthy, he not only forgives you, but he says, I must come to your house today. I want to encourage you, if you've never given your life to Jesus, that's what Jesus wants. He wants us to repent and come home. If you've never become a Christian, repent means to turn 180. And I had somebody say to me one day, they came up and said, Pastor, I've turned my life around 360 degrees. 
And I thought, well, that's probably true for a lot of us. We say, I want to change. Man, not so much, right? The truth is, repentance means I turn around and I say, Jesus, I can no longer handle life on my own. I surrender my life to you. I know that Jesus died for my sins because I'm messed up and broken, and I surrender my life to him knowing that he died and rose again. If you want to do that today, I'll be here after the service, and you can say, I want to give my life to Jesus. That's how it starts. It gives you a new perspective. If you're a Christian and the truth is you're struggling with either how Jesus looks at you or surrendering an area to him, hey, it's all about repentance. God, this area of my life, I don't have right. I surrender it to you. He allows you turns. It's a great thing. And he'll give you a new perspective. I hope you'll get a new perspective during this series of how much he loves you. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time, your word, your power, your strength, your love. Father, we are blown away. It, it goes beyond our human understanding that you could love us so much. But thank you that you do. Father, I pray if there's anyone here or watching online that doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender to you. Lord, thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.